The Koi Gig Pod and OTB Sports in association with Cadbury. A player and a half deserves a glass and a half of support. Everyone ran their socks off tonight and they left everything out there. They're very proud of the, the team's performance. Let the shackles off Katie a bit so that she can go and play her game. We're going to go out there to beat them. We're going to try and beat them. Hello there, I'm Kathleen McNamee and Karen Duggan is back with me for episode 32 of the Koi Gig Pod on OTB Sports. We're officially into the thick of the knockout stages and Spain or Austria are sadly on their way home, but we still have two more quarterfinals to look to uh, forward to as well. But I suppose, Karen, we'll start with the England-Spain game. Quite the match. Uh, I don't think... Oh, no, sad. You're right. Atmosphere We're... like that. All tournament. It was quite unreal. Yeah. Um... I'm so sad. Oh my God, Spain were incredible to watch. I think that was the best performance of any team for the first probably 70 minutes. Um, um, Yeah, we spoke about their lack of killer edge up front before the game and how it might affect them. Um, I thought it would be more even. I didn't think they'd dominate possession in the way that they did, but they absolutely were tearing England apart in the first two thirds. England couldn't get close to them. Um, and I think that's reflected by the fact that Beth Mead was taken off, who's been Serena Wiegmann's like mm-hmm. golden girl the whole way along. And the their left back who came in, she had her first game of the tournament and she was absolutely rapid. It was so good to watch, but it did cost them in the end not having that killer edge. And the bench, again, that we spoke about worked for England. Yeah, it was kind of like when I was watching the two teams warm up, Spain were doing just basic like passing drills where it was just like one touch football back and forth, back and forth. And England were very clearly doing a drill where they were trying to build up from like playing it out the back from like Millie Bright and Leah Williamson all the way up to the top. And even just watching them do their drills, I was like, I feel like England have more of a game plan going into this. And then for the first like 45, 50 minutes, I was just like, no, they like Spain were so comprehensive you know like Fran Kirby didn't hear a peep out of her for no. the start didn't hear a peep out of Beth Mead really either even Lauren Hemp looked totally lost and like yeah. she would have been the player that I would have thought would kind of be able to come that back. battle was interesting the one with her and Batia like we yeah. had a good WSL Manchester derby on that side and obviously in the WSL we'd have to say that Hemp has won that battle but yeah. I thought that Batier had the bit between her teeth and she just she didn't give her any space. Um I did I don't think I expected Spain to be as aggressive as they were. Mm. Um, but it, they really did like set the tempo and some of their one touch stuff, like you said, was it's obviously bred into them. Um and that's yeah, why yeah. they practice it in the warm-up. Um definitely the, the best team to watch mm-hmm. on paper. So it's sad that they've gone out this early. I think that, that would have been a worthy final. Um, yeah I wish they had someone like Austria and they would have gone on just so we could have seen more of them yeah yeah but it was annoying as well then that build up for like whenever he did start to play a bit more defensively when England got that goal back he just seemed to revert back to all their old ways of playing and all the play reasons that we saw them in the group stages and we were like okay maybe they're not all that impressive yeah I think that they were kind of just hoping for a moment of magic then um down the right hand side and it was you you did worry I thought I did think as soon as England got the equalizer that there was no way that Spain were going to win now they did press a little bit in the second half of extra time but then they were reverting to crosses and I mean I think Millie Bright won every header that came within 50 yards of her absolutely phenomenal there, uh, there's a great video of her after the game because I don't think I've ever seen Wiegmann or the English players that excited but she like picks Wiegmann up in this like yeah hug and just dumps her back down again <laughs> I think it was relief because they knew that for most of that game they didn't look the likely team to win mm. in saying that I think that the style of play that Spain played is was the biggest challenge that England will face I think most of the teams that are left now play a more similar style to England yeah and England have possibly a little bit more than them in terms of attack and flair so they I think they knew in the videos we saw after is that they knew that they possibly rode their luck uh, Mm. and they still came out the other side of it which is going to be a huge boost for them going forward do you think People like Alessia Russo made more of a case for her to start 
over someone like Ellen White or even of like course a- she absolutely did um she was putting herself about she set up the goal um and I would think Ella Toon as well given that Fran Kirby was so quiet and she apart from that moment where she set up um a goal for Mead I think in one of the group stages has been pretty quiet but we know that Serena Wiegmann simply will not change that starting lineup. She'll continue to use them as 60 minute subs. And it's worked so far. So you can't really question it too much. Um, but I do think that in every game that they've come on, that duo have been so impactful um, mm-hmm. that they deserve a lot of praise. Um, but maybe it's it's the right, maybe it's the shock factor that they bring and that kind of different style of play but they work so well together. I think if you're putting one in, you nearly need to put two in. Well, that's the thing, because they're such a duo, like between the two of them, they've set each other up, I think twice or three mm-hmm. times so far in this tournament. And they just know where the other is going to be. And just their movement is so good. Like I was watching them and where Frank Kirby and Beth Mead and like Ellen White just was offside the entire time. Yeah, All struggled to actually make any sort of space. They came on and just automatically it was like the game was opened there. up. Yeah, yeah. yeah and- even like um the goal, like the little triangles and stuff that they make. I think we highlighted it in the previous game. Like Russo nearly started the move and she ended up about 20 passes later finishing the move. And um, Toon was fairly central to that. And they just do bring kind of, a different element I think it is that understanding that they're so used to each other mm-hmm. um they play really really well together and it is harsh on them because I think on any other team they'd be given a look in because if you come to a major tournament um as young players like that and make such an impact you'd think you'd be in with a chance of starting um but it won't happen um I don't know. I I don't know what it's like in England. Is there people kind of thinking that maybe they should be given the chance now? Oh yeah, definitely. Like I think Alessia Russo more so than maybe Ella Toon. Just yeah, well, I mean she's clinical. She's yeah, so clinical. She, I think it's like in eleven games she had something like seven goals and two assists. Yeah, and chances are going to become less and less now and yeah. the fact that she is putting goals away at the rate that she is and we saw the kind of havoc that she caused in the box as well everyone talks about um Ellen White in the air but Russo was very very strong for that goal that set up her pal so yeah it is it's very very harsh in her but she did get that player of the match when she did come on in the in the previous game so I think yeah, her confidence is high. Partnership. If it's not this tournament, I can't see them lasting That's... all that long as substitutes coming off the bench. No. Um, and then our second game that has already happened is Germany and Austria. Germany a two 0 win. We had Lena McGill and Alex Pop. I saw Pop get the goal, and I was like, oh, "Karen's gonna be happy." <laughs> yeah, and I was like, for her still to be running, and I think maybe was at the 89th minute. Now I know yeah, it was a massive mistake minutes. by the goalkeeper, and you never like to see that. Um, Austria is still trying to play out from the back in the 89th minute oh. when you're one nil down in a quarter final. Um, some eyebrows may be raised to that, but yeah. in fairness to Austria, they took the game to Germany in a way that I didn't expect them to. Um, to be fair, I gave them no hope going in, and two nil might look like the Germans were totally in control, but even if people look at the highlights, I think Austria hit the post maybe three times mm. and were very, very unlucky. Now the Germans were Germany and they were clinical. Possession that Germany had. So I think they had close to like 65% possession for most of the game, like 20 shots. Like Austria had about 10 shots. You know, Germany probably... Germany were definitely worth their win. I just expected the margins to be a lot bigger and for Austria not to threaten in the way that they did. But I think that was tactical as well. They knew they wouldn't have the ball and they knew that when they did get in those advanced areas, they'd have to make the most of it. And unfortunately they didn't. And like you say, Germany should probably be converting more chances. Is that the only kind of chink in their armor? Because like you say, they're very dominant in possession. They're very slick the way they move the ball. And um, they'd never look under pressure. There's no panic really in the Germans, um, which is interesting to see um, as we go through maybe that that, kind of confidence in their play will continue to shine whereas other teams might get more nervous um but it was a decent a decent effort by Austria I think that they went as far as they could expect to go in this yes. round 
Yeah, no, I was impressed with Germany and I was, it's a bit like you said, there was no panic. Like when mm. I compare, say, the England game, it felt like England started to panic a little bit in the match when they weren't yeah. getting chances and they weren't converting and especially with going the goal down. Yeah, I felt like the England game was a game where I was like shouting at the telly, whereas yeah. the Germany game, I was a bit more like, oh, this is a nice game of football, you know, I can relax a little bit, whereas... I... <laughs> Yeah, there was no relax. There were some choice yeah. words when that second England goal went in in my house. <laughs> there was also some choice words from the Spanish journalists in the press box. I don't think I've ever seen people so, so yeah. interested. Um, and do you think that, like, having watched Germany and England, has your opinion changed anymore on the two of them in terms of, like, where they're going to go? Um, I find it hard to put like a favourites tag on either of them now. Mm. Um, I, I had been saying England, um, but just how Spain played and how they managed to dominate possession. If Germany were allowed that much possession, I'd imagine they'd be a bit more ruthless with it when it does come down to it against England. In saying that, I think England, again, in those wide areas are so dangerous and their bench is so strong that I could never rule them out. I think that, Based on form so far, they would be worthy finalists. Mm. I don't know then, what you're thinking now after seeing them. England definitely disappointed me a little bit. Like, not disappointing. I think Spain the impressed, though. Yeah. I think it's more like, to be Spain. But that's the thing. Like, I suppose they just were able to keep so many of their key players out of the game that I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, well, if Spain can do it, there's definitely other people still left True. that could do that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Germany are just so chill about everything that I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I can't see you going all the way and like not really putting in a performance where you're like, wow, but mm. at the same time, they get the job done. Yeah, like Spain wowed us and they're gone home. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, and then coming up today, we have Sweden versus Belgium. I think most people know how this game's going to go, but after the last two, I'm like, maybe I don't know anymore. <laughs> um, no, we we do. I think we do know how it's going to go. Um, Belgium have kind of exceeded everyone's expectations in getting to the quarterfinal. They aren't a team that, you know, you'd even have picked out too much from the group stages saying, oh, they were really good to watch or you just had, kind of have to applaud them. They got over the line in a way that Italy and Iceland couldn't. So um, they kind of know their limitations though as well. Like they know that they're not as professional an outfit as other teams and they know that they're not going to dominate possession and things. In saying that, they've showed against France that they can be difficult to play against. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think they're going to have to show a lot of that again today. Sweden, I think, still have a point to prove. I know they put a lot of goals past Portugal, but Portugal had had to expend a lot of energy in those first two games to come from behind twice and nearly pip the Netherlands. So I don't think that Portugal were a true reflection of themselves in that game. In saying that, Sweden had come under a lot of criticism and put five goals in and the likes of Black Senius now, she's off the mark and she'll want to continue in that Mm -hmm. vein of form. So I think Sweden will win it. They should win it comfortably. On paper, they should win it comfortably. But I just have found that they haven't quite set the world on fire yet. So mm. do you think all the COVID cases that they've had and the fact that like, like the, Peter Garharson was talking yesterday and basically saying, I'm not going to say who's tested positive and who's tested negative because I don't want to hand Belgium any sort of advantages in the uh-huh. thing. Do you think yeah, well, I mean, we don't know yet, kind of either, do we? So yeah. it's hard to say how impactful, like if it's Aslani, Rolfo and Black Stenius, you're thinking, oh crap, we could be in trouble here because... Rolfo in particular when the chips were down I thought that she's yeah, been the one that showed the most spark the most creativity in that team Aslani who we know is just she's so central to to everything they do and mm-hmm. if they want goals Black Senius, I think comes into the mix there so if it's those three you'd be under pressure I think if it's any of their back line I can't see Belgium bothering them too much I think that whatever subs come in should be able to handle them but it's just in terms of if they're losing big characters so say if it's Ericsson and her leadership or things like that it'd be interesting to see how they react to it but we just don't know what the impact will be yet yeah and 
when you say like Sweden need to put in a big performance to get through to the like I, I probably even just to get, to get through, through I think it's confidence going into the semi I think they'll yeah. get to the semi but, but whoever to get through to people's heads that they are favorites or that you know they do have the talent to do is that like putting a load of goals past Belgium or is it just a yeah. general performance for me I think it is putting a load of goals past Belgium because we saw when England were putting a load of goals past Norway that we all kind of stood up and took notice and we were like okay I want to watch this team I want to see what they can do no one's saying that about Sweden after their performances no one's saying oh I can't wait to watch Sweden whereas yeah. you were saying it about England you were everyone was talking about the likes of hemp and Russo and things like that, whereas no one's really saying, oh, Sweden have too many outstanding players apart from Rolfo, I would think so far. So it depends how that kind of affects them. Maybe they don't care. Maybe they're just happy to kind of potter by and get their grind out some wins. Yeah. But knowing that they were giving themselves the favourite tags and that they want to progress themselves into a place. You see people talking in their interviews, I think Eric's and maybe... Um, or mentioned it again that they need to get used to this favorites tag and it's where they want to be and things like that and if that's the case then you need to start kind of putting your stamp on the tournament yeah there's a stink of a team like Ireland off them sometimes and that when they get that favorites tag they just can't perform yeah. and they can't pull it out of the bag you know you think of them before the competition everything they've done at the Olympics like even the jersey with explaining yeah. how to beat them and they've just kind of Faltered because or... yeah I think that kind of caused intrigue and kind of excitement around them as well like the way that they built themselves up and that Olympics performance um so we expected big things well you wouldn't say their vein of form going into this was stunning I know they cruised through their qualifying group but again we saw Ireland take points off them um and teams will have learned a lot how to play against them the only thing is Sweden and Belgium haven't played each other in a very 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 long time so yeah. there'll be no fear on one side for Belgium but there'll also be no confidence that they can go up against the second best team in the world and beat them and then finally we have France versus Netherlands which is still I I mean it's going to take a lot to top England and Spain but it still is one of the best ties of the round yeah it is it's big name ties um it's two teams that we think can score a lot of goals, particularly now that Vivian Miedema is back. I think that that's going to be a huge boost for the Netherlands. And it's interesting because the Netherlands really came to life in the second half of their game against Switzerland. Obviously, they started getting the goals towards the end of that, whereas France had very much been a first half team. Mm -hmm. So it'll be kind of intriguing to see um, how the Netherlands cope if they do go behind will they still be able to grind it out um well, even and, throughout the tournament Netherlands have kind of been a second half team like they, yeah because like Sweden game. that first game kind of stands yeah. out to me because I was like oh my god Sweden are miles ahead of the Netherlands here but they came back in the second half and they still managed to get a result and it was a very important result that they they got a draw there um but it I'm delighted that Miedema is back because I think they need that boost, particularly with the loss of Lika Martins. Yeah. Um, but to if be they're... fair as well, they'll be boosted by the fact that they their young girls came off the bench against Switzerland and they were the difference. Yeah. Um, while France have lost big players as well, they they still look very threatening in attack. Is there one that's kind of sticking out to you as the one that's possibly going to do it? Yeah, I I think despite the fact that they don't tend to get past this stage in the tournament, I'm mm -hmm. going to tip France for this one. Yeah. Just again, because the Netherlands, they've looked shaky at the back, I think, at times. They've left themselves kind of exposed a little bit. Um, they've got Janssen playing out left back. Not quite natural there, but when she was centre back against Portugal, she was kind of getting the run around and I think if France can get their game going early doors and mm -hmm. can get a couple early goals, I think the Netherlands might struggle. Um, in saying that, I would never rule out the Netherlands because they have been a second half team. And I do want to see Miedema go further in the tournament as well. Yeah. That's the only thing it has been kind of harsh in her to have missed out in the way that she has. Um, mm -hmm. But no, I think for me, France slightly tipping it on I'm, I'm actually just going for entertainment value. I think France have given us a little bit more entertainment value. <laughs> now that I've lost Spain, I just want a bit more <laughs> uh, yeah. something to 
have me shouting at the TV again, which I think France yeah. can bring. Well, yeah, because I was thinking about this and I probably would be the same as you. Like I'd be leaning towards France as the more likely team to go through. But then I was like, that Iceland result, you know, they didn't really show all that much in it. And I don't know, was yeah. it that they'd already qualified and like Iceland just dug their heels in, but Netherlands probably haven't had that sort of result against the similar sort of opposition. So I'm like, am I yeah. judging them too harshly? Hmm. No, like France are France, like they're unpredictable. They did make changes. So it kind of makes me think that their bench isn't overly strong, France, which is why I think that they do need to get a good start. Um, because when they did make those changes, they kind of struggled to to break Iceland down. Yeah. And saying that Iceland again, they were the team that just like they had that in their locker and they just didn't show it in the group stages. They should probably be where Belgium are today. Um but yeah, entertainment value. Let's go for France and hope that it's a 6-5 thriller. <laughs> and I would love that so much. Yeah. <laughs> I think we need Yay. that. You need that to stay awake. At I this was going to say, running on empty. Keep me awake <laughs> <laughs> for the rest of the tournament. I need those sort of score lines. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we shall leave it there for today, but we will be back on Monday morning to get you up to speed on everything that's happened over the weekend. And of course, look ahead of what we hope will be some very exciting semifinals. The Koi Gang Pod on OTB Sports is an association with Cabri FC, official snack partner to the Republic of Ireland Women's national team we'll see you all next week the koi gig pod and otb sports in association with cadbury a player and a half deserves a glass and a half of support